is I'd like to welcome you to the Commission's community conversation, and that is what it is. It's a conversation, and it's a civil conversation, as always. Uh, the commission, uh, Commissioners present are Roger Beale, Jerry Houston, Professor Leslie Hughes, and Professor Will Steffen. Before we start this evening, I wish to acknowledge the traditional owners, because after all, they were here before any of us. And we'd like to say thank you for allowing us onto the land. I'd also like to thank the, uh, pa pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and of course to the elders from other communities who might be here as well. I'm Tony Eastley, I'm from the ABC. I do AM in the mornings and I used to do a little television a few years ago. Uh, it's pretty hard to get me into a suit these days but because uh, radio is usually jeans and a t-shirt. But uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be asked to come to Port Macquarie and to do this this evening. And I thank you for coming along as well. And the aim of the evening is, of course, to begin a conversation. The Commission is here to listen uh, and as well as share some of the knowledge and experience they have. And this group of people on this stage, believe me, has a lot of cumulative knowledge over the years. They're not here for any, any, by any mistake. They are experts in their fields. John Oxley, when he first uh, discovered this place, he said it was a great and safe harbour, very capacious. He knew what he was talking about. And he got here because he had an inquiring mind. He was an explorer. He wanted to make a new world. You've got inquiring minds and that's what we're going to try and satisfy tonight by asking questions and getting these people to give you straight answers. Before we go though, there's no one around here that uh, knows this area better than the local federal MP. And I've forgotten his name now. He hasn't been in the media very much, has he? Rob Oakshot, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Tony, to the Commissioners, Birupai Elders, past and present, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming out tonight. I promise to speak for uh, under one minute, not 17. Um, and it really is just to say thank you. There is a lot going on in town at the moment. The Ironman um, is booking out all the hotels. It's a night of global calling, not warming. Um, and there's a royal wedding happening on TVs uh, for the next 24 hours. So thank you for coming out and uh, investing some time into trying to work through uh, what is one of the most, uh, if not the most, complex uh, science, uh, economy and political issues of our time. So thank you all for coming and hopefully we have a really good conversation this evening and uh, um, for many, many uh, engagements over the next six to 12 months. As well, thank you to the commissioners for coming uh, today. This is. Uh, the third regional town they visited, Geelong, Ipswich, and now Port Macquarie, and I gather um, there are many more to come. Uh, they've had a busy day looking at coastal erosion around Lake Catai, a business lunch, a breakfast, uh, and some uh, visits with essential energy. So looking at it from an energy uh, and electricity retailer point of view, from a jobs perspective from Port Macquarie, and then some of the implications in and around coastal erosion. So thank you for investing your time and coming and visiting us here in Port Macquarie. Everyone have a great, great night, a great conversation, and hopefully we all learn something from this evening. Thanks. Thank you, Rob Oakshot. Ladies and gentlemen, Roger Beale is an economist and a public policy expert whose achievements in the field are recognised by the fact that he was made a member of the Order of Australia in 1995 and promoted to the Officer of the Order of Australia in 2006. Currently, he's an Executive Director of Economics and Policy at Price Waterhouse Coopers. He's going to introduce the Commissioners. Thank you very much, Tony. Now, this is already a success for, for me tonight. I got up the stairs. And that's no mean achievement, and I managed to get up without falling off the back of the stairs. But the night is yet young, so we'll see how it all works. First of all, I want to um, apologise for not being Tim Flannery, but more importantly, to apologise uh, on his behalf for his absence. Uh, he had a long, long contractual commitment to appear in North America, which he couldn't uh, break. And speaking of breaks, our other uh, commissioner, Susanna Elliott, broke her arm and uh, it was pretty messy. I had to have an operation and they're not allowing her to fly uh, because of the anaesthetic and uh, a number of other consequences which 
I don't understand. Um, the Commission. The Commission is not a policy advice body. It's not a body that is arguing any unique approach, any one path to climate heaven. So we don't have particular policy barrows that we want to push. Our aim and our brief is to be independent of government, but to tell you what we know about the science, why we think it matters in terms of the impacts and consequences, what we know of what's happening globally, and then what we might do about it, and in particular, the relevance of a carbon price, however that happens to be delivered. And we have a bipartisan commitment uh, to a 5% reduction by 2020, which is quite a significant target. That's more like 20 to 25% on a per capita basis, which is not that dissimilar to the commitment, the unilateral commitment that the Europeans have made. So partly we'll be talking also uh, and asking, uh, answering your questions about um, why a price might be an important part of any policy mix. Now, if I can introduce the commissioners uh, that uh, we have with us tonight. Professor Leslie Hughes is one of Australia's leading systems ecologists, people who have spent their life studying and understanding how ecological systems are impacted by things like climate change. She's a major player in the adaptation uh, studies area. Um, NCAF, the National Centre for Ad Adaptation Studies. So all about, ask about the impacts of climate change, the impacts it has on natural systems. And of course, she's, she's much broader than that in terms of adaptation. Uh, Will Steffen, I first met many years ago, uh, is a leading, a globally leading and nationally leading climate scientist specifically a climate scientist from the ANU. And he will talk about the fundamental science and address those questions that we all have about the science and uh, the many issues that occur to people. Um, my simple take as an economist, and I've been involved in this debate since uh, 1993, is that the core of the science is very closely understood and indeed pretty well accepted. There's a lot of debate around the edges in terms of feedback effects and consequences and the details of measurement uh, on a number of other issues, but that the core has been getting stronger and stronger and stronger as I've been observing it. Finally, Jerry Houston is one of Australia's most distinguished businessmen previously president of BP. Um, and if anybody knows about the power sector, fossil fuels uh, and industry, it's Jerry. Uh, finally, I'm a, a policy analyst and economist, so uh, you, know, you can ask uh, those sorts of questions of me. So without any more ado, we'd like to really have a conversation with you. Thank you, Roger. Well, you have, uh, have noticed, of course, that there is a triathlon in town today. And when I was coming in by cab, the big guy driving the cab noticed straight away that I wasn't a triathlon. Triathlon <laughs> wasn't wearing lycra and pushing my bike into the uh, front of the uh, hotel. But he did ask me a question because he said, oh, well, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm here for the um, commission meeting tonight. And he said, oh, look, I don't know what to make of all this climate change. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, after all, we have had climate extremes before, haven't we? We had an ice age. And I sort of nodded and I thought, I don't, have, I, don't know, I don't know what to say to that. And when I met the commissioners today, I thought I'd pose that as the first question because I've got the microphone and I can do it. You'll have your chance in a second, but just I want to ask that question. This cab driver 
he was puzzled. We have had extreme climate change before. After all, we got, a, we got away with it with the Ice Age. Will Stephan, if we can kick the evening off, he's going to answer that briefly, and he's got some slides, and then we're going to go into the Q&A. Thanks very much, Tony. Well, I'll try to be very brief, because we really want to engage you just as soon as we possibly can. But the cab driver's question and similar ones come up all the time uh, in the other forums and in emails and so on. So I'll try to answer them very quickly. And then my colleague Leslie Hughes will talk about what does the science actually mean for Port Macquarie in terms of the things you might expect in terms of impacts. So let's start with the basic physics, which has actually been known since the 1860s. And that has to do with the so-called greenhouse effect. And if you look at the surface of the Earth, up in the atmosphere, the middle part of the lower atmosphere, there's a belt like a blanket of greenhouse gases. The most important of those is carbon dioxide. And this is the way it works very simply. Our planet is kept warm by sunlight coming in. And that sunlight comes straight through the greenhouse gases. They're transparent to that. But to maintain the balance so the Earth doesn't get warmer and warmer and warmer, we must emit energy back out. And we do that as heat. You can feel it on a night, the heat coming back up from the Earth's surface. Now here's where the greenhouse gases come into play. They absorb some of the heat that goes out, and these arrows coming down means they emit some of it back down, making the Earth warmer than it would otherwise be. This is an entirely natural effect, and it's based on pretty fundamental physics. So when nature changes the amount of greenhouse gases, the Earth's climate changes. And so does it when humans change it. So let's look then at the Ice Age question. So if we go to the next graph, this is a very long time period, 400,000 years, nearly half a million. And interestingly, modern humans, ourselves, our own species evolved somewhere in the middle of this, about 200,000 years or so ago. So this is a map of the climate during the time we've been there. This middle red line is temperature. And there you see the ice age that Tony referred to. And there's another one. It's very rhythmic. Here are the warm periods. This is an unusually long warm period and it's the one we're in. This is the only period in which humans have developed agriculture and civilizations. The top graph is carbon dioxide. Now you can see a fairly close relationship between carbon dioxide in the air and temperature of the, of the air. Now if we go on and look at what's happening right at the end of this record, right where we are now, you see CO2 is somewhere around 280. We call that parts per million, but let's go and look what happens now. Here's the same CO2 graph that I just showed you, but CO2 is now about 390. This red line on the end is the additional CO2 that humans have put into the atmosphere since the industrial period. Most of that, about 80%, comes from burning fossil fuels. Now, we saw in the previous graph that there's a relationship between temperature and carbon dioxide. So we would expect temperature to start rising if, in fact, we've put this CO2 in, which we have. So if we look at the long-term temperature record, this goes back to the time of, uh, of the Roman Empire. This is AD 200. And we have ways of estimating what temperature was, looking at tree rings, looking at corals, and so on. This is the so-called medieval warm period. There's a little ice age. But this red line, what's happened to temperature since the Industrial Revolution? You can see quite quickly that it's unusual. It's now higher than anything we've seen back 2,000 years, probably back to 6,000 years at least, and maybe more. And it's rising at a very rapid rate. And it parallels the rise in CO2 in the atmosphere. There are many other reasons that we know with a very, very high degree of confidence that what we're seeing is a CO2-driven change in temperature. So all this is understood very well. There's no debate about it in the scientific community, those of us who work in the area and who publish in the scientific literature and so on. So this part is, is, is really well known. Now obviously, what we want to do is look toward the future, where we're going. And this simple graph tells us something really important. The next decade is critical. What this shows are the emissions of CO2 uh, on a different scale, again from about 1900 up to the present. And here we are at 2010. Now the two lines diverge from where we are because we can make a choice. We can make a choice to do nothing, and that has really big consequences if we do nothing. That's the red line. Emissions will keep going like this. Or we, as a global community, can choose to start bending that curve and bring it back down by 2100 to a decarbonized economy. 
and have it mainly decarbonized by 2050. What are the consequences for climate? Well, here's what we are now, temperatures creeping up. If we take control of the situation and reduce emissions, we will have a temperature that more than likely won't quite reach two degrees. That'll require us to adapt, but it'll be livable. If we choose to do nothing, we will have a planet we probably can't live on, or I should say our grandchildren, by 2100. This is what the temperature will be, four or five degrees above pre-industrial. So in terms of timing, you may have heard a lot of time scales talked about in terms of climate change, but this decade, right at this point, is the critical one that humanity has to make a choice of where we're going to go. And that's one of the reasons that we're here tonight, to talk about the various issues associated with how we might choose a pathway in terms of our emissions. But I just want to now uh, set the stage for my colleague Leslie Hughes by saying that already, with a little under one degree temperature change, we see some influences on our climate here in Australia. Here are some examples. Heat wave in Melbourne, 2009, disrupted transport. People had to sit on the, stand on the platforms, couldn't get to work, couldn't get home, because the rails had buckled because it was too hot. It was 46 degrees Celsius in Melbourne in February 2009. Great Barrier Reef, about 15 years ago, there were no bleaching events. The sea surface temperature has risen. We've had seven or eight severe bleaching events in the last 15 years in the Great Barrier Reef. Bushfires, there's the Victorian bushfire uh, in 2009. We've had a record number of extreme bushfire weather days in the last decade. Again, it's pretty directly linked to the fact that the underlying temperature is going up. And we're seeing more uh, high sea level events. This one happens to be from the Torres Strait Islands. But we visited Lake Katai this afternoon. And you can see evidence again of erosion, which may have some influence by, by the fact that the sea has risen by 20 centimeters in the last 100 years or so. But now I'd like to turn it over to Leslie Hughes, and she'll talk, talk to you more specifically about the Port Macquarie area and what might be in store here. So over to you, Leslie. Thanks, Rob. First, let me talk about what climatic conditions you guys might expect um, to, to have here in Port Macquarie over the next few decades. Um, these uh, projections come from the CSIRO and they're based on what's called the A2 scenario and you don't have to worry about what that is except that it's the scenario that best captures where our greenhouse gas emissions are tracking at the moment. So firstly, by about 2050, what we would expect um, around in this region would be a temperature increase, mean annual temperature increase, of between about one and three degrees. So currently, Port Macquarie has a uh, mean annual average temperature of about 23.6. Just to give you um, some context on this, Brisbane has a mean annual temperature of about 25.3. So what we'd be looking at would be the mid-range of these projections would give um, Port Macquarie around about a Brisbane climate over the next few decades. Um, if we hit the top of that projection, you'd be looking more like a Gladstone climate here in Port Macquarie. Rainfall is really difficult to predict. Um, so rainfall changes are quite uncertain, um, but it's more likely that they'll be on the drier side than on the wetter side. Um, so with increased temperatures and possibly um, drying rainfall, uh, we would be getting more evaporation. Um, that will mean that if we have droughts, and droughts have been intensifying in recent decades, they will be drier and potentially longer droughts. And finally, the sea level rise projections for this part of the coast are about 40 centimetres or so by 2050, and up to about 90 centimetres by 2100. So let me just talk about what impacts those sea level rises might have for a region like this. Okay, so firstly, um, as the sea level uh, goes up, of course, water comes further inland. So what we would be expecting from a 40 centimetre sea rise would be what's called a coastal recession. That is water coming further inland by about 20 to 40 metres by 2050 and by about 45 to 90 metres by 2100. 
Um, we're already seeing a lot of coastal erosion in this region. We were at Lake Katai this afternoon. Um, it's losing about its 20 centimetres per year, so any sort of sea level rise will exacerbate that existing problem of coastal erosion. Um, we will also get seawater seeping further and further inland, seeping into the subsoil, particularly those low-lying regions in the Lower Hastings, um, which will be starting to affect agriculture in those regions. Um, we will get any sort of sea level rise means that if there's local flooding, um, it will intensify, especially if it comes combined with a storm surge and a high tide. And then We'll get um, quite a lot of loss of coastal infrastructure. There is a lot of, um, there are quite a few houses, there's quite a few sewerage pipes, etc., built actually very close to the coast here in the Port Macquarie region. They will be at risk. And finally, um, we will be looking at the loss of sandy beaches, the loss of some Aboriginal uh, cultural sites along the coast, things like seabird habitat, intertidal habitat, low-lying coastal wetlands, etc are all vulnerable to a sea level rise. Finally, here's just some other sorts of impacts that we might see both generally and also here in Port Macquarie. I think when a lot of people think about climate change, they think about things like polar bears and they don't really relate it to their own patch. Well, climate change will be felt by everybody in every patch. So firstly, natural ecosystems, and this is my own um, area of research, this North Coast region has um, a, a really distinctive characteristic in New South Wales. It's the most biologically diverse region in the whole state. So you've got something very precious here to take care of. Um, you have quite a lot of patches of literal rainforest. Uh, they will be threatened by fire. Rainforest isn't very good at dealing with fire. As we get more extreme hot weather and extreme fire days, um, those rainforests will become increasingly at risk of having fire, which they are very ill-equipped to deal with. And finally, in the natural ecosystems, what we're expecting to see both globally and in Australia is very high increased rates of the chance of extinction of many of our species, um, including that koala up there. Um, agricultural impacts, as I said earlier, intensification of drought. Um, our livestock will become increasingly stressed by heat. Uh, there will be increased impacts of diseases and pests um, and reduced grain yields and crop yields um, from elevated CO2. And finally, health. Um, in a country like Australia, uh, we have a very good health system and um, health impacts will be far less here than in a lot of developing countries. Nonetheless, um, some sections of our communities, particularly the elderly and socially disadvantaged and indigenous communities, are potentially at risk from increased deaths from heat stroke um, and also from uh, increased infections of mosquito-borne diseases, by which I mean things like dengue fever and Ross River fever. So I'll, I'll leave it there, but um, I'd be happy to answer more specific questions on any of those things as the night goes through. Thank you. Professors Leslie Hughes and Will Stephan, ladies and gentlemen. Now, the Q&As. Let's get into that. Yes, OK. There we have someone over there, the young man with the striped jumper. Uh, hi, I'm Luke. I'm from Port Macquarie, and I'm a student. Um, I guess I thought I would just ask the question that's probably on most people's minds tonight, uh, why would putting a price on pollution be a good thing for Australia? Commissioners. Well, um, I'll answer that, but then Jerry might wish to add to it, Luke. Uh, unlike size, prices matter. Um, if you're not convinced about this, ask anybody who's running a supermarket, a service station, any farmer, who's deciding which crops to plant, any businessman who's making, a business person who's making an investment. Prices do matter. They do affect behaviour. That's fundamentally so. A price placed on the polluter will get passed through the chain to some extent. The polluter will change, but also they'll be able to sell less of their product. The intermediaries, the people who are buying the products from the polluter 
will push the polluter hard to cut their costs, um, uh, cut their pollution so that they can offer a competitive product. That's the way it works through the system. Price then drives innovation upwards to reduce emissions and it drives avoidance and energy conservation at the final use end. Well, uh, Joe, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I, I suppose, you know, as, as a businessman, one of the things that, um, that, that I reflect on is, um, you, know, you know, we made a choice over the last, you know, 50, 100 years um, as to whether in society we'd go for a, you know, sort of what I'd call a centrally planned um, um, economic model or a, or a market model. And, uh, and you know, I think, I think it's fair to say that countries like Australia and, uh, and the Western world have, have um, benefited strongly from, you know, uh, market economics. And for market economics to work, you need a price signal. And, you know, I, th I think that's a simple, fundamental um, business truth that uh, is, is uh, you know, applies particularly to something that we want to, uh, um, or we need to control, such as the CO2 emissions. So it is, um, <coughs> it is fundamental, but it's not the only thing that's going to be required. You know, there are some things that, are, that the market signal can't do, um, and and there'll need to be other regulatory things in place, you know, such as, for example, um, you know, um, mandating certain standards on pollution for cars to make sure that you know over time the cars that construct and come into the fleet are uh, um, you know more, more environmentally friendly than the ones that we've had in the past. But it is you know I, you know it is fundamental, and and a lot of times you'll hear about solutions, potential solutions to. Um, this, this whole issue of CO2 emissions that don't seem to have a price. Well, you know, almost all of them um, cost money and therefore have, a, have an underlying price implied in them. So they don't actually get round the fundamental issue of whether a price is necessary. Jerry and Roger, nice and brief. Thank you very much. Let's move to the lady here with the scarf on in the blue down the centre. Thank you. I'm just Grey Power here, interested in uh, the climate change and from perspective of ancient history. I just got a question from Professor, Ste Professor Stefan and Professor Leslie. Uh, at the time of the dinosaurs, what would you imagine the temperature would have been at that time? Good question. Uh, that was about 65 million years ago. Uh, much, much warmer than today, probably on the order of five or six degrees warmer. CO2 was much, much higher than today as well, probably 900 to 1,000 ppm. It's interesting that uh, after the extinction of the dinosaurs and, and the change out of that period, that geological era, there's been a very slow decrease of CO2 in the atmosphere, which has driven a very slow uh, decrease in temperature until we've gotten into that pattern, that very rhythmic pattern of uh, ice age warm period for about the last million years. at that time quite well, a moist atmosphere, and uh, I say we are actually maybe going back to that. Will that affect us? Very good question. Um, <clears throat> as I, I alluded to on that graph I showed, uh, we're far from being creatures that are adapted to the climate that dinosaurs had. Uh, we've evolved, uh, in fact our ancestors, the hominids, have evolved in the last two or three million years when temperature was much colder than the time of the dinosaurs. The only climate that we know of where modern humans can develop agriculture and then villages and cities and civilizations is the last 10,000 year period, a very stable climate. It's the period we're actually starting to leave now. So we do not know whether Homo sapiens can exist in a climate that's three or four degrees warmer. My guess is no because of our physiology. Uh, I'm sorry, that's, that's two questions. L Professor Leslie Hughes, did you want to follow up on that no, just briefly no, about fine. what it m might mean for humans in that sort of environment? No? No. Okay, next question, please. A uh, gentleman here, thank you. Harry Creamer. Um, a question for Jerry or perhaps Roger. Um, the, ho the horse drawn era in transport ended because Henry Ford invented the motor car. Can you tell us a bit about the inventions for a clean energy future that we can look forward to and how putting a price on carbon can help us to get there? 
Yeah, I think that I, I think that's a great question. I, another thing, actually, that uh, um, yeah, helped draw to the end the horse-drawn era is that places like Melbourne and, and Sydney were um, getting pretty difficult to live in because they were filling up with uh, horse acrement and. Uh, and so there was a pollution of its own type there that uh, led to a change. Um, and now we've replaced it with another one. I, I, there's, there's, you know, there's been a big body of work that said what are um, all of the things that could be applied to, um, you know, to, to, to lead us into a much lower carbon economy. And um, you know, there's a, there's a you know, scientific piece of work done by Princeton University. You know, so they talked about the, the famous Princeton wedges. Um, basic energy efficiency um, in, um, in, in buildings is, is one part of it. Um, um, either finding a solution for coal-fired power stations through carbon sequestration or, or finding another fuel for them. Um, using gas in power stations rather than coal, it's much lower, uh, a much lower carbon footprint. Um, biofuels um, correctly produced is another one. Um, obviously, renewables such as solar um, is is uh, is is part of the uh, potential solution in the future, and um, and and also wind. Uh, one of these 14 wedges, uh, you know, that, that was um, that was used. You know, one is one is um, is also um, uranium, which has a zero, um, virtually a zero footprint when it comes to carbon. So. Um, so there's a whole there's a whole host of them. Some of which are ready to go today, and they just need the right incentives. Some of them are actually feasible, uh, you know, at, at the lab, you know, the, the lab level. But they actually need industrial scaling up, and that needs, um, you know, that needs appropriate support to actually get it through what I call the, the technology valley of death. But you know, I, I would speculate to say that, uh, you know, in in a in a hundred years we could be seeing a world where. Um, where solar could be a huge part of the energy equation, um, where um, on-road transport, you know, would be through electric, um, electric cars, um, um, you know, fueled by renewable energy, um, and, uh, and 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 also there could be a lot of liquid fuels around, which are you know, zero carbon through um, second-generation biofuels. So they're just some of the things that uh, that you know would. Would be sort of the macro things that happen. I think, yeah, basic um, basic energy conservation at, uh, and and changes of the way that we live are going to be fundamental to that because you know we're not going to be able to continue with exactly the same lifestyle. All right, um, we'll wrap that Jerry up there. And do you want to answer uh, something else? Just, just 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 very briefly coming back to the price of carbon, uh, uh, the question that was asked, and I, I think two things have come very clearly from what. Jerry has said. Probably the first of those is that there's no single silver bullet. And if anybody tells you that there is, they're probably trying to sell you something uh, that defies the laws of second law of thermodynamics or whatever. Um, there's no single uh, silver bullet. We can't all wait for fusion energy to arrive. Um, it's been 50 years away, uh, you know, for the last uh, 100, well, 20 years away for the last uh, 60 years. Um, second point, price of carbon won't necessarily help at the end of pure research or indeed at this point of actually doing the scaling up. Uh, those demand technology support. But what a price of carbon is very good at is pulling that technology through when it's in place. When it's getting to the point where it is a commercial opportunity, if you take into account all of the costs, including carbon costs, that's where a price of carbon is critical. There are lots of those technologies which are ready to be used now, which we know can lower our carbon footprint if the market has an incentive to use them, and that's what a cut price of carbon will do. All right, thank you, Roger. We'll move on. Uh, another question. This gentleman's had his arm up. It's almost lost its blood. My name is David Farrell. Thank you. Um, it's a book called The Coming Famine by Julian Cribb. It's dated Canberra 2010. And I haven't finished reading it, but one of the big issues that comes out of this book 
is that some countries will actually benefit from global warming. The, the food productivity of countries like Russia, for example, may well go up. If we're trying to fight for reduced carbon dioxide and not forcing the temperature up, will we get international agreement when some countries feel they'll benefit, others will get seriously damaged? That was always one of the fears uh, of us global... Cl I, I, I have to confess a sinful task. Um, uh, one has to do this quite frequently, of course, but um, a long one. I've been involved in this issue, including as a global negotiator, um, uh, since the mid-90s uh, until I retired seven years ago. Um, one of the fears was that if you could be quite specific about who'd win and who would lose, and one of the major countries was a major winner, that you uh, would um, uh, possibly get into a situation where it became very difficult to do a singular global deal. Well, for my sins, I still sit on an advisory board to the Chinese Premier. Um, and they are quite convinced that they are major losers coming out of this. Uh, North America, there are enough studies to demonstrate that they are losers as well. Russia might win at the margins for a little while, but as you are getting to that warming, you're actually increasing some of the feedback cycles because you're probably uh, leading to some lending, le uh, melting of the permafrost, and my science colleagues might t talk about that. But there's a broader impact on the actual productivity of plants uh, from uh, carbon dioxide fertilisation, and perhaps Leslie and Will might. Okay. Um, I think to follow on from Roger, there'll, there'll be winners and losers out of climate change. That, that's undoubtedly the case until we get to such a, a hot planet where everybody's a loser. Um, wheat in Russia may well be a winner uh, in the short to even medium term, um, but there is, a, there is a physiological limit for all plants um, in terms of the, the range of temperature that they can grow in, and even wheat will find a, a range if we don't control greenhouse gases where it can't grow either. Um, the other thing that I think Roger was alluding to is that, that when you grow plants at higher CO2, uh, they grow faster because uh, the carbon is the substrate of photosynthesis. Uh, so they grow bigger and they grow faster, but they actually become less nutritious, and that's because they take up less nitrogen to balance the extra carbon that they're sequestering in their tissues. Um, and nitrogen, of course, is the building block of protein, and that's what we all need. So um, that was what I was alluding to in my slide earlier, where I said that some crop and grain yields, um, there'll be bigger plants, but they'll be actually less nutritious. This is particularly the case for grain crops like rice and wheat. Um, they'll have less nitrogen in them and you'll have to eat a lot more of them to get the same amount of nutrition. Claude, that explains some of my tomato plants in my backyard. Thanks very much. Uh, now, uh, there's a gentleman over here with his hand up. Okay, your name please and you. uh, where are you from? Yes, I'm Terry Minahan. I'm from Port Macquarie. Uh, just a brief observation, there are not many young people here tonight and I think the uh, Commission can do very well to uh, many, many, many means uh, many. Um, I'd, I'd just like to mention the, the elephant and that is uh, China. China is currently uh, emitting more than 20% of the world's carbon dioxide emissions. Um, Australia's probably about 2%. In the last six years, China has doubled its emissions. And I ask probably the economists here, um, why should Australians be imposed with a carbon tax while China gallops ahead. Thank you, Terry. Uh, Go ahead. I, I'll answer. As, as I said, I actually, uh, um, uh, and, and just to demonstrate that this is a bipartisan uh, matter, I was nominated by um, uh, Alexander Downer. Um, I'm on Premier Wenji Bao's International Advisory and Economic Panel. That has half foreign devils, half very senior Chinese people. Now, China is in fact embarking on perhaps the most rapid energy intensity reduction program. Uh, and now they've got additional to that specifically emissions reduction 
uh, aims on a per unit of production basis that has been seen to this point globally. Now this is a major, a significant achievement. Will China's absolute emissions increase? Can we stop them from increasing? The answer is yes and no. China's absolute emissions will increase uh, and it's unlikely that we can actually get them before about 2030 to a point where they will turn down. Um, when you put this to the Chinese, they say two things. First of all, it is absolutely, both uh, in their view, immoral to ask them not to develop in the interests of their people. Um, and secondly, they say, we are not responsible for the stock of carbon that's already in the atmosphere and our current emissions are large, they've now passed America, um, they're large, but um, they are not contributing to the climate change we currently have and they're small, the cumulative stock is small compared with those that the West has already put into the atmosphere. And the third point they make when they look at people like us is that they say, and every Australian produces five, six, seven times as many units of carbon dioxide as each Chinese. Um, and it's very unreasonable to ask us to stay where we are. Now this is, raises a difficult question. It means that there must be a level of, uh, if we're not gonna get into some sort of global conflict, a level of capacity to uh, recognise that there will be growth in emissions from China and from India and from Brazil, that's absolute growth in, in emissions, at a point when the West will be producing its absolute emissions. Uh, that, uh, it's, it's a cap and convergence model. Perhaps Sorry. we could throw that to Jerry too, because it's a matter of business I think you're getting at that we don't want to be behind the eight ball and be in, in a matter of fairness. Jerry, do you want to just add something to that? Yeah, I, I think there is another concern out there that if, if, if we, um, you know, if, if, if we move before some of the um, some of the other countries, then some of our um, you know iconic businesses will be um, damaged competitively. But you know, the, all I can say is there's, there's nothing I've seen from uh, both sides of politics that would say that you know they're not moving to ensure that uh, that we don't shoot ourselves in the foot, that we we actually make sure that uh, the you know, the energy intensive trade exposed industries um, are, um, you know, are protected through the transition period that, uh, that, that Roger was alluding to. But you know, I, I, um, it is, um, just back to Roger's point, it is, um, you know, if, if you just think about it as a, uh, as a business proposition where you've actually created, um, created pollution, um, whether you do it, um, you know, inadvertently or not, but you know, the oil industry certainly ha at times has, has, has created uh, pollution. The obligation has fallen back on the creator of the pollution to actually clean it up. And, um, and you know, that, that I think plays into the Chinese argument as well. We all done? Another question, this lady here had a hand up before, did you not? Uh, Chris Wilkinson, English and media teacher. I guess my question to you is how do we overcome the community ignorance and the attitude today that people will listen to shock jocks or the gutter press rather than scientists to help us move forward and deal with this huge issue? Well, I'll get someone to answer that. I had, it, I had it, an idea today that I thought I'd put the commissioners out at the MCG before the football game. We'd have a Q&A there with 100,000 people looking on or the NRL or anywhere else. But it is difficult and it's a hard one to answer. Um, Will, you've not said much lately. Perhaps I should <laughs> give you a go or do we do any, no, many, look, miny, mo? Look, I, I really don't have a good answer to that. I can tell you that my colleagues in the scientific community are really frustrated uh, by their treatment in the media. And, and a lot of them, I think, have just stopped dealing with the media because they've been denigrated and, and degraded in, in many ways. Uh, by the media. It's, uh, my observations from working a lot around the world is that this country and perhaps the USA are unusual in this sort of uh, problem. If you go to Europe, if you go to Scandinavia where I lived for a while, uh, this doesn't occur. 
So I do think we have, have an issue here. I rec uh, but I don't have any easy answers. If I did, we'd, you know, my colleagues and I might be able to make some progress. Anything, Leslie? Uh, I'd just add to that, I guess, um, I don't have any good answer either. If somebody in the audience does have a good answer, I think you should let the Commission know, uh, because really that's why the Commission was formed, because there is so much confusion out, um, promulgated by certain aspects of the media and certain aspects of politics. Um, and that's why we all came together to do this, uh, to try to provide a, a, a credible and trustworthy and independent voice when people have genuine questions and concerns, and, and that's why we're here. Yeah, it certainly makes uh, uh, forums like this all the more important, and both for you and for scientists around Australia. Uh, the gentleman on the corner here with the white T-shirt, you've got a microphone, if your name, please. My name is Laurie Byrne. I'm an organisational change consultant here at Port Macquarie. Um, following on from that question, I noticed that the ABC was criticised for giving equal time to both sides of the debate without reference to the quantum of people who represented either side. So 97% of scientists, for example, were recognising the, cl the climate issues and yet they were given only 50% of the airtime by the ABC. So maybe my question's to Tony Easley. <laughs> Has the ABC rectified that imbalance issue that they acknowledged at the time? Uh, I think you actually presented on one of your P uh, AM programs, in fact. And is there, uh, at least in the public broadcaster, an intent to address that issue of I imbalance? Look, I'd love to answer that, but I'm here on behalf of the Commission <laughs> and not the ABC. But I'd be, I'd be happy to have a chat with you afterwards if, you, if we want to have a get together and just have a chat. But I can't do it publicly. And I'm not here on behalf of the ABC. I'm here on behalf of the Commission to act as an MC and a facilitator, keep you guys under control and keep this mob up here under control as well. So I'm sorry, I can't do that. Then may I address it then to the, the, the commissioners as to whether they have seen uh, any addressing of that issue after it has been brought to public attention? Uh, not that I'm aware of, and it's, it's an ongoing issue. Um, and I, I'm glad you referred to the so-called debate. And, one thing that I will make really, really clear is on the fundamentals of climate science, there is no debate uh, in the community. And by that I mean, is the earth warming? Yeah. And the word we use is unequivocal. What's the major reason for that warming? It's the additional greenhouse gases, the most important of which is carbon dioxide. Uh, and we know that with the... There is no debate about that if you go into Journal of Geophysical Research, Nature Science, preceding National Academy of Science, Royal Society Journals, and so on and so on. Uh, that's where science has its debates. We do have debates about aspects of climate change. How fast might sea level rise, for example, is a good debate. How stable are the big polar ice sheets on Greenland and Antarctica? Uh, good debate about those. And that debate occurred in the reputable scientific literature. It does not occur on shock jock radio. It does not occur on the ABC. It does not occur in the Australian or elsewhere. Uh, and I think we want to make that very clear to the public is science does test itself really hard uh, and, and, and really carefully. We do have debates, but we go on. We don't debate whether the earth is flat or round any, anymore. We don't debate the laws of gravity. We don't debate whether apples will fly from the back up to a tree. We don't debate earth, air, fire, and water versus the atomic theory. We make progress. We go on. Same thing with climate. We know a lot about the climate system now to a very high degree of certainty. And it's on this basis that we're discussing policy, the need to get emissions down, how best to do it, and so on. All right, thanks. Well, I've got a... Uh, oh, we've got a whole lot of hands coming. I was about to read one of my questions from here. Let's go to the young man in the second back row on the aisle. Thank you very much. Um, Chris Mundy, McKillop Senior Campus, Port Macquarie. I was just wondering why in such a uh, resource-dense country such as Australia are we a follower <laughs> to the global economy and why do we not uh, sort of become on the forefront and use our businesses and corporations to put money behind these uh, other alternate fuels and sources of energy and sort of more towards uh, the businessmen here, uh, why do we sort of let finance control such a uh, science-driven topic? Jerry, do you want to have a crack at that one? Yeah, it's a great question. I'm not sure I can, I can, I can absolutely do it justice, but I think, you know, 
you know, Australia has been built to a large extent on, um, on, on some fairly significant energy intensive um, businesses plus um, um, relatively cheap energy through you know, brown coal and black coal, et cetera. So, so um, um, you know, I, there's, there's no business that you can turn around overnight. So I, you know, I, I think um, the, the, the key in all of this is going to be the transition. And uh, I believe that uh, you know, Australia can be a, uh, a vital part of that transition to a lower, um, to a lower carbon economy. Uh, and, and I think Australia does punch above its weight. Um, despite what we've you know, heard about you know, the irrelevance of Australia. My experience of Australia you know, working for a multinational company is Australia punches well above its weight. And, um, and unfortunately, we've seen lots of examples of um, technology developments in Australia that haven't been commercialised here and they've had to go offshore to be commercialised. And so I think a lot more could be done. But I, you know, it's, it's, there is no point in trashing today's business um, overnight and believing that a new one's going to start up. You've got to manage a transition sensibly and any, any um, you know, so any response to climate change has got to recognise that there's a transition that we have to go through. The longer we wait, however, the longer we wait, the more difficult that transition is going to be. Mm. I've got a question here from Tony Doherty of Taree. He says, is there any hard evidence that a carbon tax and or an ETS will mean a net loss of jobs in Australia for big business? and or send businesses overseas? It's a, an often asked question. Do you want to? Well, uh, I'll start, uh, but uh, Jerry will uh, round this out. If Australia were genuinely acting totally alone, if it were to pursue a very tough emissions target, and if it were to have no border adjustment, if it were to actually say, well, look, we'll just turn our back on these industries. Uh, if they're uncompetitive, they're uncompetitive on a global framework, then certainly there would be risks of losing, uh, losing jobs. But none of those ifs are going to happen, are they? Um, no government that is going to get elected, and I've worked for 50-50 uh, for both sides, uh, is going to introduce a scheme in which they fail to address the emissions intensive trading exposed sector which would be at competitive risk globally. Uh, there will be a lot of argy-bargy about how much it needs to be protected on a case-by-case -case basis but um, every scheme that I've seen and every scheme that operates internationally uh, has actually had that in place. Uh, so that would be my answer from that point of view. Jerry? Yeah, and I, 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 I think it's, you know, once again, it's back to how you manage that transition. And, uh, and as Roger said, if you, if you, you know, sort of jumped overnight, then there would be disruptions in the economy. There'd be winners and losers. And I think over time, um, as, as, as we have in uh, every generation of, uh, you know, of Australians, there's been um, um, a partial or almost complete transformation of where people find their work and what they're doing. You know, um, in Australia, a very high percentage today is in the you know, work in the services industry. Um, we're, we're going through um, a, a mining boom. But in the future, you know, we, we could find that the jobs will be in different places. But I, um, you know, given the, the rhetoric there is on both sides of politics today, it's, it's almost inconceivable that a carbon um, a, a price on carbon in its own right is going to you know, lead to dramatic, dramatic changes in the short term in terms of jobs. And over time, um, the, the, the jobs will change as they have in every generation that we've, you know, we've been through uh, in the history of this, of this country. Um, my name's Ben. I'm from the Australian Youth Climate Coalition. Um, mine sort of follows on uh, by this gentleman's comment that there's not many young people here. Uh, in trying to get young people active and involved in this, I've found it pretty difficult at times to even get young people to take an interest. So my question to you is, how do you think we should get young people interested in this? Okay, that is a good question. How do we get all Australians interested by, for that matter? Uh, let's go, Leslie? Yeah, uh, sure, I'll have a, have a crack at it. Um, 
Uh, yeah, it's really important because it's actually your future. You know, anybody over the age of 40, you know, probably won't feel the impacts all that much. Anybody under the age of 40 and um, certainly, you know, our grandchildren are going to feel the impacts of climate change a great deal. So, in a sense, it, it is the younger generation that is absolutely critical to reach. Um, ah. Well, look, it, look, I know, it's, it is a struggle. How do you get people, young people interested? We find it on the ABC that we, we, we want to get, you know, generate interest in programs and how do you do it? How do you go out there? Anyone in the audience got any ideas of how to get young people involved in, you know, safeguarding the planet and doing stuff for the planet? Anyone got an idea? No, you've already had your say, sir. Well, but just another question. The lady over there right in the corner. Oh, no, it's a man. Sorry, in the corner. My apologies. <laughs> No, I just, you had your head turned, sir. I couldn't see the, uh, the, the sharp jaw and that steely gaze. I was, I was going to say in my most masculine voice that I <laughs> that uh, with my teenagers, I find the best way to um, get them interested in energy usage is to turn off the hot water system. <laughs> That's cruel but fair. All right, uh, another question, please. Let's have another question. Now, I promised the gentleman right at the back there a moment ago, you, wait for the microphone, sir, and your name, please, and where you're from. Laurie Lardner, I'm from Port Macquarie, and this is probably a question closer to home. Uh, we've had a major problem on the north coast, be aware of the drainage of acid sulphate soils, with the sulfuric acid in the estuaries killing the fish habitat and also damaging coral reefs. I also understand the drainage of these lands have an, uh, have an impact on the emission of carbon dioxide. Probably a question to Leslie. How significant is that, please? Um, look, I I confess I'm not an expert at all in acid sulphate soils. I mean, they are an enormous problem all up and down the coast. I guess all I can say is, is my understanding is that um, patterns of acid release will change as salt water starts to intrude more inland. So some acid sulphate bearing soils will become more covered and so will become less of a problem. Um, but as agriculture then and other sort of infrastructure then uh, retreats away from the coast and disturbs the soil, as has been the problem um, earlier, you will probably get more um, acid sulphate release from areas that have not um, been a source of it so far. So what the net um, of that will be, I don't know, and I don't think anybody else knows, um, but I think what we're looking at is a different pattern of acid sulphate release. Next question. Um, right at the back there, the gentleman with his, in the blue. Uh, Ken Holly. Um, my biggest question, or the elephant in the room, I think, is population growth. If we're having all this problem at the moment with six billion, what are we going to do with nine billion, which is predicted in a very short time? That's a curly one. And it's one that's been asked before, I guess, in the other commission hearings in Geelong and, and elsewhere and Ipswich. Who'd like to tackle it? Will. Will? Yeah, look, that, that, is, that, that, is a, that is a really, really good question. Uh, and we have to take into account, uh, obviously, population projections as, uh, as well. Right now, we're approaching 7 billion, uh, the Earth's population. I think we're 6.9 at the moment. The best projections I've seen now, which have been consistently revised downwards over the last decade, is about 8.5 billion, topping out at 2050 and then starting to decline a little bit after that. Birth rates have dropped dramatically, faster than most people uh, have thought possible, even in Africa. So the issue I think we really face here is a bottleneck of how do we get through uh, this next century where a good fraction of that, now 7 billion, uh, soon to be 8.5 billion, need to come out of poverty. Well, at the same time, we need to protect the global environment we all depend upon. That's the real bottleneck we're talking about. Population is important, but I think there is light at the end of the tunnel when you look at the global projections. And I, I, I think just, just, just adding to that, I think it really does sheet home in the Australian context, um, you know, having, having a really good holistic look at, at, at how do we... Um, how do we have a population that's increasing but doing it sustainably? And that means doing it better than we have in the past. And you know, I, you know, I live in Melbourne and I look at uh, you know, some of the sort of the indiscriminate um, uh, you know, suburb building that goes on at the fringes of Melbourne without a public transport system going into it. Um, and, uh, and, and, and you know, the sort of lack of one accountable authority to manage development in some of the major metropolitan areas. And you know, how, how infrastructure is is um, 
is regarded as a cost rather than a benefit, and getting the right infrastructure in place um, is, is very important. And we seem to be always trying to play catch up rather than actually getting on top of the game. But I think sustainable population growth is something that we should aim for, and it's got to be done holistically. Honestly, I think the best uh, contraceptive is prosperity. You see that right across the world as incomes increase, as social security increases, the need and the drive to have very large families and to get beyond the net reproduction rate declines. And in China, we're actually going to see an ageing of the population and probably some population reduction of some significance over time. But would you want to get there in the way the Chinese did? I wouldn't, but that's a social judgment. Okay, some more questions, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, gentlemen at the back, have you already asked one? No? You haven't asked one, have you? No? Well, your time has arrived. Name, please. Yes, my name's James Langley. I'm a science teacher. Um, Port Macquarie uh, is rapidly developing right now. We grow a suburb about every five years. Uh, if our council could afford your advice, what guidance would you give them uh, to, to steer this development uh, forward in the light of uh, the climate circumstances? Mm, bit of a barb there. Do you want to advise the council tonight, or should we? We should talk in general terms, I think, probably might be advisable. Anyone want to have a crack at that? I'll, I'll have a quick crack. I'll, I'll follow on from what Jerry said. I think there are a couple aspects uh, here. One is, is the built infrastructure, the houses in the suburbs themselves. What are they made of? How are they designed to take advantage of passive solar? How well are they insulated and, and so on? There's a whole range of things you can do. And if you look at best practice in Europe, you can get uh, energy usage down enormously compared to the average suburban house in Australia. But as Jerry said, you need to go beyond that. You need to think of what's called the urban form. What does the city look like? How is it designed so that suburb is instantly on a, on a fast bus route into the centre of, of Port Macquarie and so on? so that uh, people are less dependent on motor cars and actually have a, a, a public transport system that works. Uh, and then, of course, we, we learned uh, today at, at um, Essential Energy that already there's some very interesting developments in distribution systems for energy. So, so uh, in addition to the immediate uh, Port Macquarie issues, you need to think about Port Macquarie in a larger regional sense of generating electricity within the region rather than being a net importer. How is that done uh, sustainably, renewable sources and so on? There are a lot of really exciting opportunities, I think, if we start thinking a little bit beyond the standard Aussie suburb. And, uh, and I come from Canberra, so I can talk about what that's all about. Uh, I, but I think if we think creatively, uh, we can really do things a lot better. And that's something maybe your students can think about, is how would you design the next Port Macquarie suburb that looks quite different, but have a great lifestyle and really reduce your energy usage? Professor um, if, Leslie Hughes. If I, if I could add something to that as an ecologist, um, the thing that horrifies me about the statistic of, of building a new suburb each, each year or each five years is, is where are they being built and what vegetation is and what habitat's being removed to build it. Um, one of the things we know about, um, about the impacts of climate change on biodiversity is that, that climate change is, is moving too quickly for most species to adapt. But some species are already adapting and they're doing it by moving to somewhere else that's more climatically suitable. So birds that can fly and butterflies and, and some marine species, for example, are actually moving south or moving uphill into cooler climates. Um, but they can only do that if there's habitat for them to move through and into. And one of the problems that we've got in Australia, and we have um, some of the highest extinction rates of species in the world, it's a very dubious world record, um, is that about 70% of our native vegetation has been either completely removed or highly modified, um, largely for agriculture and urban development. So um, my advice to the council would be, if you're going to build a new suburb, um, it's probably better to intensify an old suburb rather than build a new one, and please don't remove any more remnant vegetation, especially your littoral rainforest. As a follow-up to that, it's interesting, I've got a question here from Julie Ho, I presume she's from Port Macquarie. Why should people care if climate change kills some species and reduces biodiversity? Because after all, humans have always removed other species to get the space and natural resources they need to survive. So what have you got to say to Julie? Why care? Well, look, I think um, the, the question of why, why, we, why would you care about biodiversity, there's many answers to that, and different answers have different resonance with different sorts of people. The, the utilitarian answer is that 
biodiversity provides our life support. Um, we have uh, oxygen and food and fibre and all of those ser ecosystem services because of um, the remarkable biodiversity of life on this planet. Um, the more philosophical end of the reason why care, which is where I come from, is that every species is a, is a unique heritage item. Every species has taken probably about a million years to evolve. And we could rebuild an opera house um, as a heritage item, but we can't rebuild a species. Um, from my personal philosophical point of view, um, species are precious. We can't replace them. Once they're gone, they're gone. Um, and humans, as just one species on this planet, has no right to threaten any other species, in my view. All right, next question. Let's move along. Um, I've got a, another a young person at the back there with the red collar. Um, Bridget Allen from MacKillop Senior College and AYCC. My question is, I'm very concerned about how climate change is going to affect people in the third world, particularly in low-lying um, Pacific nations. I'm wondering, what are the current projections about how it's going to impact on them, including climate change, refugees, and how do you suggest Australia supports these countries? Yeah. Good question. Leslie. Um, I, I read a statistic just yesterday that 150 million people in the world live within one metre of sea level rise. So that's a fairly significant number. And those are mainly people in the big mega deltas, like in Bangladesh and, and other places. Um, I think closer to home, um, what Australia will be concerned with will be helping um, residents of the Torres Strait, firstly, and residents of, of some of the lower-lying Pacific Islands that are already being eroded by, by sea level rise and by storm surge. So um, I think we will be looking at a significant issue of what, what are known as environmental refugees. Um, my gut feeling would be in the next decade or so, uh, we will be moving people off some of the Torres Strait Islanders and having to find um, places elsewhere, and then further down the track, uh, off some of the Pacific Islands as well. But, in, but it's also worth saying that in many of those other great delta regions that are impacted, there are adaptation options, uh, both large-scale engineering options, which is the route that countries like China uh, will, will take, just as, as Holland did, um, and others that are more um, uh, culturally adapted and economically adapted ad adaptation uh, strategies that are pursued by people who live a more subsistence lifestyle in deltas. Uh, and that there are ways that some of them have evolved. So um, uh, it, it is a tremendous problem and adaptation has got to become part of the global uh, concern. And that's why it was really heartening that in Cancun, in the negotiations, and this was one of the one of the uh, achievements of Copenhagen. The world is actually committed to providing billions of dollars to assist that adaptation uh, process because it's real. Okay, another question. Uh, the lady in the scarf, just three back. Thank you very much. And if you'd stand up and give us your name, thank you. Hello, my name is Deb Murrell. I actually live near Warhope. Um, I've just got a question. I've been to Germany many times in Spain and they use solar and wind absolutely everywhere. On every roof you see solar. Is it possible to get baseload power from, or 50% of baseload power, from solar and wind? Well, I'll provide part of the answer to that, but then we'll flick to the colleagues. I was in uh, Denmark uh, just a little while ago and they have something like 47% of their power from wind. But that generates its own demands and difficulties because the wind blows when the wind wants to blow. So system costs have to, system design has to reflect that intermittency of um, uh, the power supply. And finding ways to store and manage that uh, is becoming quite critical. And that's one of the attractions of the better place proposal, which is to see electrical cars with their batteries charged effectively by green power, renewable power, when it's surging through the system, and that then provides a, uh, an actual storage bank. But there are many other storage banks, and this morning uh, at Essential Energy, 
we saw a four-way inverter that they've uh, developed and applied, which will enable local uh, renewable to be actually stored for a few hours because, as we know, the solar peak often uh, precedes, the solar energy peak uh, often precedes by a couple of hours the actual energy demand peak when people arrive home and start turning on the air conditioners. So I think there are going to be lots of things happening that make um, renewables far more usable as baseload. And yeah, I, I, I fully support that. I think the key, in the particular example you mentioned, I think the, the key is, is storage and, you know, w whether it's, you know, for, um, for cars or for, you know, storage uh, um, from, you know, solar electricity, you know, the battery technology is not there yet, um, but it's, you know, it's, it's going through a rapid development phase. I think, um, I think they followed a technology line that failed or wasn't, it wasn't as interesting. They followed the hydrogen line, which um, you know, didn't uh, didn't work out as planned. So um, it'll get there, but it's, it's, there's a lot of dollars being thrown at it. Is it a case, though, and I think this is what this lady was alluding to as well, is it public policy or is it personal responsibility that drives such a, an outcome in a country where they are so uh, up to scale with alternative energy? Um, I, I think it's uh, I, I think it's probably both. You, to, to get the to get the to get the public policy in place, then you've got to have the support from the community, um, and uh, which is part of our job is trying to get the facts out there so that there is support for um, you, know, you know when when political parties want to make the you know make some of the tough calls. Um, but you know th th there is also community support needed for major technology shifts, such as ultimately moving into baseload. Um, um, you know, solar power that will that will require not only you know commercial support but also community support to get through what we call the uh, the sort of the tech you know the technology valley of death where there's no sort of first mover advantage. All right, another question, please. Let's race through them. Um, this gentleman has had his hand up for a while. Just wait for the microphone to turn up. Uh, Tony, do what you've already asked a question. Oh, have you really? <laughs> yeah, you read it out. Um, <laughs> All right, okay. <laughs> That's um, sneaky. How, how will we've either reached peak oil or we soon will be? And how will peak oil, um, the, the the crisis that will come because of that, affect action on climate? And can I just answer Jim's question? No, which no, was, no. You've heard, oh, all right, very quickly. You've got yep. thirty seconds. Five years ago, Jim, the teacher back there, um, the national parks in ta in the Hastings ran a. Uh, um, uh, uh, what to do in the Port Macquarie area if, if about climate change and years 10 and 11 students came up with all the answers, including the economic ones. So go back and have a look at the butcher's paper in your high school, Jim. All right, okay. we'll pass it on to Rob Oakshot. He can have a squeeze so, too. All right, uh, now so, so, that question so, yeah, is... So peak oil, um, it's, it's interesting. For the last 40 years, we've had 40 years of, of oil at, uh, you know, available at today's... Um, you know, at, at today's consumption. So, so um, you know, finding more oil, um, technology advance, et cetera, has, has, has led to us replenishing our stock of oil, um, known oil, um, over the last 40 years. But, you know, at some stage, yes, we are going to reach peak oil um, and, unless there's, a, you know, there's something that constrains the, um, um, the demand. I think the bigger worry that we have uh, is that it's not as easily available in such convenient locations as it has been in the past. You're having to go to go to the frontiers or to politically unstable areas. So West Africa, Middle East, Russia, um, you know, the technology exists to get the oil out of those places, but, um, you know, sometimes there's not the political will for it to happen. So it's not as available as it used to be. Um, and, and then you go to the frontiers of technology, such as the, uh, you know, the deep waters, and it's becoming more difficult. So it will become more expensive. Um, so as we go, you know, go forward to bring more oil on, it will become more expensive and ultimately will run out. Um, I'd like to think that actually the environmental demand, uh, that the environment will actually demand that, uh, that, we, that we peak oil from a demand point of view rather than a supply point of view. But um, it's, not, it's, not, it's not, you know, I don't believe the doomsayers who say it's gonna happen tomorrow, but it is interesting that actually demand for um, demand for fuel in the US, demand for fuel has probably peaked as we speak today. 
Okay, we're going to rush through them now. The gentleman over the back there has been very patient with his hand up. Thank you very much. I'm sorry if I can't get to all of you tonight. Right. But we'll Ken Blacker, I'm just interested in, in the search for alternative energies, which I totally support. Uh, things like ethanol and especially seam gas potentially provides a whole other set of problems of water contamination, agricultural land degradation, the conversion of agriculture to ethanol. I just wonder whether there's any process or how that's looked at in terms of replacing one problem with a whole set of others. And, and how that's looked at or whether there's any way of being able to coordinate that sort of ad hoc journey, especially seam gas, and that's coming to Port Macquarie. Um, and all the problems, especially the ABC had a program on it that that especially... So your question is, uh, yeah. is one, the devil, better the devil you know than the devil you don't? Is that uh, what you boil not necessarily, down to? it's just in terms of in seeking alternatives, right. what processes are in place to sort of look at standards and feasibility. Okay. All right, well, very quickly, you know, I, panel. I, 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 I think that um, society has every, every right and every obligation, I think, to hold, um, you know, hold these new um, new advances, new technologies uh, to, to, to account. It, but once again, it's a responsibility, so it's not, it's not being a naysayer to something that could potentially be a solution. But I think, I think you know, we need to make sure that there are the right standards in place when, um, when new opportunities come to pass. I think um, when I think of some of the biofuels, um, and for example, what's happened in the US, much is made of the fact that it's you know, it's environmentally friendly making ethanol out of corn, it's, it's, it'd be marginal at best. Um, and that's all to do with supply security and local politics. It's got nothing to do with, um, you know, um, environmental support. So, be, you know, we have to be very careful about understanding the rationale for everything that's happening out there and making sure there's the right, um, you know, the right scrutiny. But, you know, at the same time, we've got to have an open mind. But, you know, having a fact-based discussion, I think, is a very good place to start. All right, one more question as we go through. The lady in the front down there, thank you. Uh, wait for the microphone, it's on its way. Um, Drucy Meg at Port Macquarie. Um, yeah, isn't it true that this um, solar thermal power station technology is, is ready to go? It would supply base power um, and uh, give local jobs not, not in Port Macquarie, but in, in the west over the Great Divide. And, um, it, yeah, the carbon tax would help get that sort of um, solution happening right now, and then we wouldn't have to worry about, yeah, coal seam gas that will poison our water table and <laughs> everything else. This is developing into a statement from the floor. I think part of that we've already covered as uh, whether it's a, it, it's a, a base power replacement, is that right? Yeah, I think, I think it's, uh, but I think the other issue with it is, it's, it, you know, I don't think, I think that's one of the examples where, um, you know, you can intellectualise the, um, um, so, so, so it's proven at a, at a small scale level. Major industrial rollout is something that the government is actually trying to prove through its solar flagships program. Um, and um, and it, it does imply um, major government spend as well to support the commercial sector to get through this, the sort of you know the, the the technology barrier that you face when bringing in brand new technologies industrial scale straight away so it's not it's if it, if carbon price wouldn't provide it with incentive for us to all go out and build these plants tomorrow it's going to need more work on it and more incentive in the short term to make it happen um, so it's not going to happen overnight all right anyone else i think we can squeeze in one more the, the gentleman here with the you haven't asked one yet have you sir uh john jay's north coast environment council um, trying to help with the youth question and perhaps with the renewable technology. In 2008, there was a proposal for a national regional university at Port Macquarie. What does the panel think of the potential viability from a pedagogical, scientific um, point of view of making that university a centre of excellence in renewable technology research and implementation? We could probably deal with that on a broader scale about anyone want to take it on? Uh, Roger, absolutely. maybe you could do no, that. No, I was going to say my academic colleagues. They oh, won't okay, have any conflict right. of interest, right. will they? Will. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm not sure whether uh, at this stage uh, more research on the technologies themselves 
uh, is required. I like the last thing you said, which was more research on the implementation of that. I also think there needs to be more research, if you like, in behavioral psychology in areas like that, because we need to understand uh, fear of change, uh, what motivates people to really embrace change or not embrace change, and so on. Because I think there's some deep-seated constraints, as well as technological constraints, into uh, getting on top of the problem. So uh, I'm, I'm, full, I'm fully in favor of, of research educations, uh, re research institutions, but I think we need to broaden the remit uh, and do a more holistic approach of how do societies make big transformations from the way they've been doing things for a century or so uh, into uh, new directions that seem frightening to some, but in the end may give us a much better way of life. I think there's a real role for research and education institutions to broaden that remit and take on that bigger holistic question. And ladies and gentlemen, that's where we're going to have to leave it with. Thank you very much, Will Stephan. A reminder about a couple of things. One is the uh, fill in the feedback forms, if you'd be so kind. You've been such a great audience tonight, the best one the Commission has had throughout the rest of Australia, <laughs> I might add. Uh, best weather. Oh, no, sorry. Um, and also, tea and coffee are available. So hang around and have a chat, uh, have some tea and coffee. And I'm going to ask Roger just to summarise for the evening and say his thanks to you and good night. So just bear with us. Thank you. Uh, look, I'm not going to spend a long time summarising what we've discussed. What, what's really uh, heartened me is that the, the questions are absolutely have all been excellent. Uh, they've really got to issues that are important and issues that people have concern about. What's disheartened me a bit is that um, we couldn't answer all of the questions because I saw quite a few people who'd had their hand up whom we didn't get to. So when, if you've got time, uh, we'd like to stop and chat for a little bit. Um, we'll have some email addresses. If people send in questions, and we find that there's a whole bunch of them coming up, we're looking at developing the website in a way where we can actually respond to some of those in an efficient way. And I guess my basic message is all of you um, think about this evening. I hope it's been helpful. I hope it's been helpful. And uh, talk to your friends. The next time you get one of those very strange emails, those chain emails, reply to it. Look up the Australian Academy of Science website if you want something on the science, one of the best reports I've ever seen. Simple, clear, answers the six major, seven major issues that are raised. Uh, actually be active uh, in trying to get this shifted into a debate that has logic and substance and can focus on the genuine issues rather than uh, the sorts of exchanges that we've had in the media in some cases. So I just want to thank you all so much for coming out on uh, what's, um, uh, I'm sure for Port Macquarie, an unusually grim night. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Roger Beale, <laughs> Professor Leslie Hughes, Professor Will Stephan, and Jerry Houston. And thank you. of the Order of Australia in 2006. Currently, he's an Executive Director of Economics and Policy at Price Waterhouse Coopers. He's going to introduce the Commissioners. Thank you very much, Tony. Now, this is already a success for, for me tonight. I got up the stairs, and that's no mean achievement, and I managed to get up without falling off the back of the stairs. But the night is yet young, so we'll see how it all works. First of all, I want to um, apologise for not being Tim Flannery, but more importantly, to apologise uh, on his behalf for his absence. Uh, he had a long, long contractual commitment to appear in North America, which he couldn't uh, break. And speaking of breaks, our other uh, commissioner, Susanna Elliott, broke her arm. And uh, it was pretty messy. I had to have an operation, and they're not allowing her to fly uh, because of the anaesthetic and a uh, number of other consequences which I don't understand. Um, the, commission. the Commission is not a policy advice body. It's not a body that is arguing any unique 
approach, any one path to climate heaven. So we don't have particular policy barrows that we want to push. Our aim and our brief is to be independent of government, but to tell you what we know about the science, why we think it matters in terms of the impacts and consequences, what we know of what's happening globally, and then what we might I'd like to welcome you to the Commission's community conversation, and that is what it is. It's a conversation, and it's a civil conversation, as always. Uh, the commission, uh, Commissioners present are Roger Beale, Jerry Houston, Professor Leslie Hughes, and Professor Will Steffen. Before we start this evening, I wish to acknowledge the traditional owners, because after all, they were here before any of us. And we'd like to say thank you for allowing us onto the land. I'd also like to thank the, uh, pa pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and of course to the elders from other communities who might be here as well. I'm Tony Eastley, I'm from the ABC. I do AM in the mornings and I used to do a little television a few years ago. Uh, it's pretty hard to get me into a suit these days because uh, radio is usually jeans and a t-shirt. But uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be asked to come to Port Macquarie and to do this this evening, and I thank you for coming along as well. And the aim of the evening is, of course, to begin a conversation. The Commission is here to listen uh, and as well as share some of the knowledge and experience they have. And this group of people on this stage, believe me, has a lot of cumulative knowledge over the years. They're not here for any, any, by any mistake. They are experts in their fields. John Oxley, when he first uh, discovered this place, he said it was a great and safe harbour, very capacious. He knew what he was talking about. And he got here because he had an inquiring mind. He was an explorer. He wanted to make a new world. You've got inquiring minds, and that's what we're going to try and satisfy tonight by asking questions and getting these people to give you straight answers. Before we go, though, there's no one around here that uh, knows this area better than the local federal MP and I've forgotten his name now. He hasn't been in the media very much, has he? Rob Oakshot, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Tony. To the commissioners, Birupai elders, past and present, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming out tonight. I promised to speak for uh, under one minute, not 17. Um, and it really is just to say thank you. There is a lot going on in town at the moment. The Iron Man um, is booking out all the hotels. It's a night of global cooling, not warming. Um, and there's a royal wedding happening on TVs uh, for the next 24 hours. So thank you for coming out and uh, investing some time into trying to work through uh, what is one of the most, uh, if not the most, complex uh, science, uh, economy and political issues of our time. So thank you all for coming and hopefully we have a really good conversation this evening and uh, um, for many, many uh, engagements over the next six to 12 months. As well, thank you to the commissioners for coming uh, today. This is uh, the third regional town they've visited, Geelong, Ipswich and now Port Macquarie and I gather um, there are many more to come. Uh, they've had a busy day looking at coastal erosion around Lake Catai, a business lunch, a breakfast, uh, and some uh, visits with essential energy. So looking at it from an energy uh, and electricity retailer point of view, from a jobs perspective from Port Macquarie, and then some of the implications in and around coastal erosion. So thank you for investing your time and coming and visiting us here in Port Macquarie. Everyone have a great, great night, a great conversation, and hopefully we all learn something from this evening. Thanks. Thank you, Rob Oakeshott. Ladies and gentlemen, Roger Beale is an economist and a public policy expert whose achievements in the field are recognised by the fact that he was made a member of the Order of Australia in 1995 and promoted to the office. Do about it, and in particular, the relevance of a carbon price, however that happens to be delivered. And we have a bipartisan commitment uh, to a 5% reduction by 2020, which is quite a significant target that's more like 20 to 25 per cent on a per capita basis, which is not that 
dissimilar to the commitment, the unilateral commitment that the Europeans have made. So partly we'll be talking also uh, and asking, uh, answering your questions about um, why a price might be an important part of any policy mix. Now, if I can introduce the commissioners uh, that uh, we have with us tonight. Professor Leslie Hughes is one of Australia's leading systems ecologists, people who have spent their lives studying and understanding how ecological systems are impacted by things like climate change. She's a major player in the adaptation uh, studies area, um, NCAF, the National Centre for Ad Adaptation Studies. So all about, ask about the impacts of climate change, the impacts it has on natural systems. And of course, she's, she's much broader than that in terms of adaptation. Uh, Will Stephan, I first met many years ago, uh, is a leading, a globally leading and nationally leading climate scientist, specifically a climate scientist from the ANU. And he will talk about the fundamental science and address those questions that we all have about the science and uh, the many issues that occur to people. Um, my simple take as an economist, and I've been involved in this debate since uh, 1993, is that the core of the science is very closely understood and indeed pretty well accepted. There's a lot of debate around the edges in terms of feedback effects and consequences and the details of measurement uh, on a number of other issues, but that the core has been getting stronger and stronger and stronger as I've been observing it. Finally, Jerry Houston is one of Australia's most distinguished businessmen previously president of BP, um, and if anybody knows about the power sector, fossil fuels uh, and industry, it's Jerry. Uh, finally, I'm a, a policy analyst and economist, so, uh, you know, you can ask uh, those sorts of questions of me. So, without any more ado, we'd like to really have a conversation with you. Thank you, Roger. Well, you have, uh, have noticed, of course, that there is a triathlon in town today. And when I was coming in by cab, the big guy driving the cab noticed straight away that I wasn't a triathlon. Triathlon <laughs> wasn't wearing lycra and pushing my bike into the uh, front of the uh, hotel. But he did ask me a question because he said, oh, well, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm here for the um, commission meeting tonight. And he said, oh, look, I don't know what to make of all this climate change. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, after all, we have had climate extremes before, haven't we? We had an ice age. And I sort of nodded and I thought, I don't, have, I, don't know, I don't know what to say to that. And when I met the commissioners today, I thought I'd pose that as the first question because I've got the microphone and I can do it. You'll have your chance in a second, but just I want to ask that question. This cab driver, he was puzzled. We have had extreme climate change 